This is a slightly different Outspoken Engineer podcast. Instead of talking about just air conditioning units and how-to guides, we're going to have somebody on the show which has a different perspective in the industry. He's been in the industry for, for some time. We're going to go through the overview of the industry over the last 20, 25 years. We're going to go through a bit about himself, how he got into the industry and what he did, leaving a legacy behind, and just a general conversation. Right, we're here with Dean Flint. Ex-president of Mitsubishi Electric. <laughs> head of North Head of Northern Head of Europe for hire. Yep. And also Eastern Europe. Also Eastern Europe. Hello, thank you very much for being on the show. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Right, Dean. Um one thing that strikes me about you when I met you, I think I met you four or five years ago at your house. Yeah, it was, was it? Was Friend it? Ben Ben Freeman said, go around, have a look for some aircon, et cetera, yep. et cetera, and met right. you. Um, one thing that sort of stood out, obviously you were the president, so it was quite like an honor and sort of to be up there and say, this is the man <laughs> at Mitzi that we need, I need to be with, was you were comfortable in your own skin. And it was quite obvious that you you did have an element of you don't go with the status quo about you. Um, I'm not sure if you're still like that now. Um, so basically, jumping straight into question one. Year 11 in high school. <laughs> I'm in your year group. I'm in your class. Who was Dean Flint? Okay. Um, not there that often. <laughs> oh, <be> goodness. The... <laughs> you just shot the question down from this. You... Okay. Right, so I was a bit naughty when I was younger. Um, in the north, we call it wagging it. And I would meet my mate at the uh, school gate. If we had enough fags between the two of us, we'd disappear to the park and we'd sit in the park and smoke. This was year 11 at school? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so you weren't um, you weren't top in physics. I wasn't top in anything, mate. Right. Okay. And, um, I passed the eleven plus. Was supposed to go to grammar school and um, wanted to go to the, the secondary school with my with my mates from the village. Okay. Um, so I did. Right, um, my okay. parents allowed me to do that. Um, I was okay. I was probably average or okay. below average. Okay. Only certain things interested me. Maybe a little bit of history. That was about it, really. Um, Rest of it was just a case of, you know, got to, I've, I've just got to get through this. So were in some you? Way. So were you? Were you adamant from the start of school that school wasn't for you? Absolutely, yeah, I hated it. School what? And and was that a trend in your class, or was it just a few individuals? It was, was it? probably just me, really. So if I was to sit down with some of your previous classmates, they'll probably say who was Dean Flint because he was never here. Um, yeah, um, to okay. a certain extent on the. Obviously, eventually they find out where you are and they bring you back, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But I remember having to ring my mum and say, Mum, I'm really sorry, I've missed the bus because it was a four and a half mile bus journey. And I hadn't. I'd been in detention okay. um, and I was walking home and the call the, the call box was halfway home and my mum would come and collect me. Oh, and, really? And things like that. Right, so okay. So I was a little bit, you know, a bit daft, a bit okay. silly. So I messed about, basically. So um, brothers, so, sisters? Did you have any brothers, sisters? Two sisters, uh, both younger than me. Okay. Um, by a good 10, 11 years. Um, so you were the perfect role model for a year 11 brother? Uh, well, 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 not quite, because I left home when I was 18. So. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, and, um, so for you to be like that in year 11, was that just a, was there a, uh -huh. were, you, were your parents super hard on you? Was it a case of you were quite clearly not interested in school from day one? I was, there a, was there a, was there an expectation for you to be top of your class? No, no, no. so my parents, um, were landlords um they were very busy running a pub from the age of 13 14 i was helping them um okay. in, in that as well would be doing the bottling up of a morning would be cleaning up of an evening that kind of stuff were you helping them while you were at school so yeah would you help them in the morning in the morning and, and in the evening so yeah. you were actually having more physical application you were quite hands-on with them i'm more of a doer than i am a, a learner okay I'm not, okay I'm not i'm not an, i'm not an academic that's probably the best way to phrase me okay um so um like i say um School, I hated the place. Mm -hmm. um, I, I didn't feel as though we were treated like we should be. So if you're looking, if you're working in your parents' pub or on the farms at the weekends when you're 13, 14, by definition, you're actually starting to make your way in life. Yep. And we were just treated as children at school. So I rebelled. Basically. Understood. Yeah, okay. okay. So the moment I left school, which I had to defer for a year because I failed my O-levels first time. Just going around. back to you and the pub. So can one assume, because I've, my auntie and uncle used to have a pub down in Devon. Mm. And when we were young boys, we were all sent to bed early. 
But if your parents were the landlord and landlady of the pub, mm. is it right in saying you were probably hanging around with older people and you knew a lot of older people as well? Absolutely. Okay, so you had an older head on your shoulders than probably most people in your age and being treated like a child probably wasn't the solution that you needed. That's a fair way to phrase it. Okay, yeah, So fine. my mum reckons I was born 30. Okay. <laughs> it's right. probably not fair. But okay. Yeah, okay. okay. But yeah, so... Um, when I left, I actually went to uh, Bain Bank College in Crewe uh, doing electrical and electronic engineering. Okay. And they treated you like an adult. And all of a sudden, I started to do okay. Okay. All of a sudden, instead of just passing, I was actually getting merits and things okay. like that. Yeah. So but this is when you're not so much of an independent. You're not independently looked at as a child. You're actually, you need to go out and do this yourself. Absolutely. Because that's what colleges are well, yeah. good for. Okay. And then I got, and then I got a job. Um, which was as a design engineer, um, mechanical electrical uh, design engineer. And what was that? Who for? That was the property services agency, which okay. was the uh, consultancy arm of the Department of the Environment. Do you remember what year that was? 1981, September the 13th, Blimey. 1981. Blimey. Well, Ben's off camera. Ben was definitely not born in 1981. Yeah, yeah definitely not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and... You, I definitely you? was not born in 1981. Yeah, and I don't feel old at all. Okay, <laughs> so you were born 30 and you still are 30? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, it depends how many beers I've had. <laughs> so your, 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 your upbringing was, was okay? Perfectly, yeah. Couldn't have been, couldn't have been happier, yeah. Um, well, let's put it this way. You live in a beautiful village in South Cheshire and half, an, half a mile away is the mill pool and you can spend the entire summer holidays at the mill pool. I get it. Yeah, it was idyllic. Okay. It was okay. fantastic. Okay. Um, so me going through processes, systems, and discipline when you were younger, that just would just rip up the, the, the textbook <laughs> on that one then. <laughs> if you like. There's there's no there's no discussion with it. But okay, so you went for a design engineer, you were a design engineer. Mm -hmm. Where was that transitioning for you to work in for where we know you for is working at Mitsubishi Electric? Okay, so my apprenticeship was um, heat and ventilating air conditioning. I did my apprenticeship. I then moved um, to a design office where they needed me to do electrical as well. Mm -hmm. So I did. Um, I cross-trained over to electrical. I did a project, which was the passport office um, in Liverpool called India Buildings. Okay. Be beautiful building. Um, um, the Germans threw a V2 at it, um, a V1 at it, sorry, um, okay. and it bounced off. It gives oh, you an nice. idea of how okay. it okay. Okay. Um, wonderful building. So I did that. I worked with a company called Denko Air Conditioning to mm -hmm. do the comms room. Yep. And they said, do you fancy a job? And I, they were doing what? A bit of selling. Okay, then. Sales. Yep. So okay. How um, old are you? I was, oh, geez, 89, so I'd be 26. Okay, so you weren't, okay, so 26, mid, okay, so you weren't, I was going to say 1920, okay, but you were doing designing. So 26 is when you got into sales. Yep. And that was at Denko? Yeah, so I was dealing with the M62 corridor up north. For those that are listening, you'll probably recognise the northern twelfth to this. But uh, yeah, <laughs> M62 corridor, Liverpool right the way across to Hull, occasionally up to uh, York. Yeah. And working with consultants, specifying closed control air conditioning. But okay. we would do the installation as well. So that was your first taste into the HVAC industry? No, it was my first taste into sales in HVAC. Understood. Uh, okay, because uh, you were designing Design previously. engineer first, yeah. Absolutely. Okay, so how long were you were there before you started at Mitsubishi Electric? So I did 11 years at Denko. Um, okay. Yeah, so I didn't join Mitsi until 2001. Okay, so in 2001, what were Mitsubishi like as a business? <laughs> Don't need to understand the sales as such, but <laughs> compared to what they are now, because I'm sure other manufacturers were similar then, you've seen the transition over the years. What were they like as a business in terms of market share? Um, or so, who were the market share leaders back in? Okay. All right. So, look, the first thing to understand is um, in, 19, in 2000, um, Mitsubishi Electric bought one of its distributors, which was a distributor called Kanko. And the two owners of Kanko became sales and commercial director okay. of Mitsubishi Electric. And, we went, and Mitsubishi Electric went direct. Okay. okay? I joined after that to look after Manchester for them. Sales? Uh, yeah, regional sales manager. Okay, um, And along with a guy called Steve Fleming, okay. um, who you'd be good fun to have on here, by the okay. way. Yeah, okay. okay. Is uh, Steve... Um, he's Samsung now. Thought he was. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. And he's doing a great job, by the way. Okay. Um, fair play to him. The, um, we, were, we started off just the two of us. 
Um, there was nothing there, nothing. Really? So was it as it was it almost a case of? It was a startup. It was brilliant. Brilliant. Okay. So your question was also part of what was the market share then? So by then, at that point in time, Daikin were a clear, clear market leader. Okay. To the point whereby Mitsubishi were a very distant number two. And then there was probably Toshiba and Fujitsu. So even though you were a startup as such, you as, were still... As, as you direct, were, yes. You were, as direct. You were number two under Camco. No. So there were five distributors at the time. Yeah. And the collective revenue of those made Mitsubishi Electric number two in the UK. Understood. Okay. So Mitsubishi, the product was out there and it was a known product as such. Yeah. And it was also known for being incredibly expensive. Understood. Okay. Okay. So you created the, you were the startup of Mitsi Direct. We were, yes. Right. Okay. Which, which was good fun. Okay. So your role was sales, regional sales manager for the northwest of England. Yeah. And there was guys for Scotland, uh, Yorkshire, Midlands, southwest, and southeast. Right. Okay. Um, when you started, did you think or anyone else think they were going to be as big as they were today? And the second part to that <coughs> is. When you were there, did you look at, we are going to be number one? <laughs> you know, was that the, the mantra that you were banging on your drums? We will be, we will take Dakin's top spot. Yes and yes. Right, okay. So the whole idea behind going direct was to make Mitsubishi Electric able to have a conversation directly with the installer market, with the specification market, et cetera, with a view to getting closer to the market, yeah. with a view to being able to overtake Daikin. Okay. It was to become number one. And how and how were you going to do that? So I've got something to bring up later, but I thought this is a great time to say this now. So did you look at your competition and sort of say, let's copy what they're doing plus more to take the market share? Or did you actually, was there a strategy? Okay, so the strategy was probably formed before I arrived. Okay. And I just ended up being one of the people that help, helped implement to implement it. it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the strategy was that by going direct, we would be closer to the market. Everybody else was via distributors. Including Daikin? Everybody. So your USP was your direct? Correct. Understood. Okay. Okay. And three years later, Daikin followed, and they okay. bought their distributors. Was that possibly from the back of seeing how well you were doing? Well, the first two years we didn't do too well, but we were making a lot of noise. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. So strategy-wise, you weren't carrying out, you weren't copying the competition because it didn't exist. You were the first, so your USP was your direct. Correct. And you didn't look at your competition and say, "Let's do what they're doing." You're actually saying, "Well, we're actually doing something completely different." So what I'd say to you when that's concerned is there's two parts to that. One, there is the way in which you behave in the market, mm -hmm. and two, there is the way in which your factories behave relative to providing you with products that you can take to market, okay. which you can then bring into how you behave. Right, okay. okay. So when I first joined Mitsubishi Electric, um, the, the products were me too. Okay, uh, Everyone had something similar. Yeah. Um, and um, Dakin took the lead uh, with um, inverter on, um, small, on small splits, and it made a massive difference. And that was all part of a, a European market transformation project, and yeah. all manufacturers were working towards that. Some yeah. moved faster than others. We, when, when we came with ours, okay, and mixing it with our direct to the market, direct to the installer strategy, yeah. we were able to create more traction more quickly than others, okay, because we, the manufacturer, was speaking directly to the installer to the specifier. I get it. So where the market is changing slowly now, where you've got, which has been changing for some time, where you've got. The manufacturers buying chiller companies. Mm -hmm. It's the same process. Absolutely. That is. They're also driven You're controlling. By, yeah. It's driven by the market, Jacob. Um, so, the market is going to move away from um, direct expansion, air conditioning, yeah. over time. Not completely. There's always going to be a place for it, and, and rightly so. But that will be smaller capacity systems. The larger capacity systems will go back to being more based upon water, as in hydraulics. So the market is asking for it. Yep, market so needs it. The market needs it. The manufacturers say, well, what can we do to go direct? Mm -hmm. Let's buy a chiller company that manufactures. Let's control the output from the factory. We're talking to the clients. Yeah. And let's have the whole portfolio under one household, Understood. under one brand. I can see where um, a lot of them are doing it now. Um, I'm not going to mention the names of them, but not just Mitzi. But you've got companies now that provide AHUs, chillers, Absolutely. and even DX expansion. Absolutely. Um, because it's tick, tick, tick. 
because you have everything under one brand. Yeah. So well, you can come straight to that brand and go, I have this project. Mm. I have these solutions that I think I need. Mm. What can you provide for the me? The only challenge that I, uh, I'd say the downside with that is, and you might, well, you might agree, you might not, is you're not the best at everything. So, hmm? so I'm not going to use Mitzi. I'm going to use someone else, but I'm not going to admit. If I go to Team Blue and say, well, I want BRF, a chiller, and AHUs, your AHU arm might be a rebranded product which you've now bought as a business, and that might not be as good. Look, um, so what, what I would say to you where that's concerned is... Um, because the integration side of things makes it probably easier because they've in integrated everything onto one platform. It's all, it's all in the timing, okay? So um, whatever happens, eventually all the products that come out of that brand, mm -hmm. regardless of where they're made, will meet that brand standard. It's only a matter of time as to how long it takes to take it from where it was when they bought it to what they want it to be when it's when it's that brand standard. Understood. Yeah. So for everyone um, watching, we've had a conversation before the show, and what I've learned is that the brand standard out of different factories is basically what makes the products what they are. They could all be made in the same factory, but you could have different production lines with different standards. And that's what makes a brand sometimes what the brand is on a certain product range. And, and that is determined by the market. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what people might accept in, I don't know, Southern Europe um, relative to a, perform, uh, um, a split type unit, a room air conditioner, mm -hmm. might be different to what people in Scandinavia want out of it. So in yeah, Scandinavia, it. it's going to be heating priority. Yeah. Minus course. 25. They're not going to care about that mm -hmm. in Southern Europe. Yeah, of course. So the demands of how the product is developed and the, performance characteristics uh, is determined by the market gotcha gotcha okay um you were obviously at mitzi for some time before was it that was the role the president <laughs> yeah it was yeah. okay o only very well, did you come up with that or was it a case of we're going to call him the president no no no, no it was only very briefly so look okay i used to look after what was called les living environmental systems yeah. which was the hvac mm -hmm. things, okay so myself and a guy called Donald Dorr, we were responsible for looking after LES. Yeah. You were the sales, he was the brains. He absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We were called Pinky and the Brain. I was Pinky. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah, okay. Right. So, okay. So, uh, the older people um watching this. They'll will, get that. Well, they'll the, get that. The older ones will. Okay. Yeah, the younger and ones, they'll probably agree. Yeah, but for sure. Yeah, oh, okay. Absolutely. Right. Right. Uh, and it was a guy called John Knock that nicknamed us that as okay. well. Okay. Uh, okay. okay. And, and, it, and it stuck. Yeah, okay, which is fine. I don't mind. I'm yeah. you know, I'm happy to admit that he is probably the brightest guy I've ever met. Okay. The Matrix okay. code means something to Donald Dorr. It doesn't okay. mean anything to anybody Fine. else. Okay, okay. so I, I get him. He's on the spectrum, but the right side of it. Very, very effective. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. As, a, as a father of a, um, a, a son that is on the spectrum, um, it doesn't, there is a way in which those, those talents can be channeled. And uh, Donald used to say, you're good at what you're good at, and I'm good at what I'm good at. Good. Boom. Fair enough. Works. Yeah. It's a team. Okay. So... Um, Going back to um, going back to the point when it was the pinky in the brain and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, look, the reality of life is is that um, people have skills, don't they? And that's the way in which you work. So, you some know, some people, yeah. If you're if you're good at something naturally and you keep, I've said this a lot of times to people, and people have said the same to to me. Um, if you're good at one thing, sometimes you're better at just nailing that one thing than trying to spread yourself thin and trying to. You can do anything, but you can't do everything because. And, and that it, was the and that was the mistake I made. Okay, so when I became the branch president, I was responsible for the whole of Mitsubishi Electric UK and Ireland. Okay, that included factory automation, that included automotive, okay. which is an information. You system. were personally responsible, or did you have you were responsible oh, no, of the teams that were managing? Absolutely, them? yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. And that was um, it was you know, the Japanese guys that asked me to do it, and it was a strategy um, okay. across the whole of Europe to have Europeans to be the heads on a country by country. And for whatever reason, they asked me. Okay. okay. Um, I did say, uh, when, I, when I was first asked, I went, really? Me? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, bearing in mind, you know, landlord, son, all that kind of stuff, time served, not degree and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, and the other guys across Europe were either HR people or finance So, but for, for them to ask you though, I'm oh. going to, they're going to, I'm going to say that you're obviously prolific sales. But prolific sales, not prolific me, growth. Not me personally. Okay, it's always, 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 always about the team that we created. And the team that you created, 
that's what I want to get to the bottom of is how did you develop your team? You know, I know Mitzi do and other brands do your disc training, you know, the colors. Were you looking at, are you looking at reds and yellows? Are you looking at stone cold okay. mortgage salesmen? You know, what's your, <laughs> what's your, what was your, uh, what was your niche? Cause I'm, I have a similar uh, theory, you know, with, with, with our sales, with us, it's engineers. For me to be a contractor, I'm giving the game away here, guys. But for me to be a to be a, a an ex engine a good engineer, a good engineer will never sell like a salesman. There are de- caveats with that, but if you put them in front of the right customer, they will nail it. Did you have a? You'd meet someone and go, he could sell our product. I'm sure you know. Who did you have in your team for that? All well, right. So having mentioned color profile, uh, which obviously is because um, I would say you're uh, you're probably you're all of them. A bit like myself, you have to be all of them. We all are. It's okay. But naturally, you're not a blue. Absolutely Mr. Not. Donald Dore is a super thorough blue. Absolutely correct, yeah. But yeah. as a, your role, you had to be a bit of everything. Correct. But at heart, you're probably red and yellow. I became very red towards the end. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yes, so, no, is it sold, is it not? <laughs> the numbers are wrong. Yeah, be good, be brief, be gone. Yeah. Um, um, but the, the thing about that is, is that actually the people were in sales that are the most successful over the longest period of time are green, which is people that are loyal, building long-term relationships. Okay, we were very the happy-go-lucky guy. Everyone likes very that, friendly. That's, that's the yellow guy. The green guy is the quieter guy. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. The green guy is the person that everybody gets along with over time. Yeah, over time. The quieter guy that you underrate, but you see the you see something in them. They're not talking too much from the start. Good listeners. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, and they form long-term relationships. And by forming long-term relationships, you create sales over a long period of time. Wow. So what were we looking for? We were looking for people that could differentiate themselves from the next person. That's all we were looking for. We didn't care how they did it. We just wanted them to differentiate themselves against the next person. Interesting. That's really what we were looking for. And that's right. how we built the team. That's how your team was built. And that's how we built the team. It wasn't my team. And in regards to the, how the team was built, so having your pool of greens, would they be managed by a, a green or would you have a solid red? Red meaning someone that is very direct in selling, okay. uh, not well, controlling them, managing them. Just because when you're, you know, when you're responding to a sales, when you're looking at sales figures, you need someone to be pushing. You, know, you need to have the, the sales master or subcon- you know, calmly whipping to make sure they get as many sales as they can. And that's not usually done from the friendliest guy in the room. <laughs> okay, so the answer to that is, do you? Is that what you really need? So the conversation that we would have would be, okay, this is what the sales are this week, this month, mm-hmm. this quarter. What's the pipeline? What's the backlog? What does it look like? Why does it look like? Because when you're running a business, which as ours was, was truly national, okay, you would and have, it was a startup national as well. Which, well, that was at the beginning. Okay. By, this, by this time, it's become established. You know, so we're now talking 2005, 2006. We've okay. become quite established. We're probably employing 50, 60 sales guys, five or six sales managers by this okay. time. So by this time, we'd become more of an evolved business rather than scrabbling around trying to find whatever we could find, okay. which is what we were doing when we first started. Um, but at that point in time, it was quite established. So we had a hybrid of everything. We had a blend of everything. And those complementary character types Mm -hmm. and skills is actually what made it quite a good team because we would let everyone in the room have their voice understood okay Okay. so you had the you had the customers and you could allocate accordingly absolutely so you had you had several tools yeah and we had thousands of customers remember as well Uh, so there was an awful lot to go around so you wouldn't put a green with somebody that needs a red because we we need a i think our current rep um from itsy she's um She's a green, but she's got definite strong red tendencies when she needs to, which is what we require. Well, that's probably because you've been naughty. Cool. Well, we <laughs> you meant you made a free comment. What be 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 brief. Be good. Be brief. Be gone. That's us. That's it. That's us. <laughs> um, if you could go back to Dean Flint on day one of the presence role, what advice would you give him from where you're sitting now? So you've mentioned about your team. Uh, would you change your plan? Would you have looked at it different and planned more, knowing what you know now? Right. So, um, and this would transition. Obviously, if you were to, it wasn't at a Mitzi role. You're president of, you know, a different manufacturer. You know what? 
Just more on the learning side here. All right. So from my perspective, um, day one, I didn't realize that I'd made um, a, quite a big mistake for Dean Flint. Okay. Um, I had moved too far away from the customer. When I was still the divisional manager of the air conditioning division, yeah. I was daily in contact with customers, be them the distributors or be them yourself. Oh, what? really? What? Okay. Uh, Bigger clients, I, I'm going to issue. No, no, no. doesn't matter who that was. But you were, you were in the mix? Yes. Okay. And the moment I moved into the president's role, I became more of a business manager than a sales manager. Okay. And that was the first thing. So, so is said, this where you go back from the start of you're, you're, a, you're a doer as such rather than a, more of a planner? I'd be good at what you're good at. So I'm not necessarily the greatest guy in terms of you know, finance and um, you know, um, compliance and things of that nature. Okay. I had a great team of people around me that did all of that stuff with me. Yep. Okay, yeah? But I still had to be the person that fronted it up. And that wasn't the problem. The problem was the extra degree of separation from the customers. Okay. To the point whereby, do you remember when we first locked down, mm. I had a guy ring me from a, um, uh, an air conditioning business in based out of Milton Keynes. And he said, look, Dean, I'm really sorry to ring you. I know it's not necessarily your gig anymore, okay? but I need to speak to someone. I've got a problem. I need a seven kilowatt wall mount. And people are basically saying, you, you haven't got any. I went, leave it with me. So I went and spoke to the person in the air conditioning business that looked after the stock. And I went, what is the situation? They went, right, well, it's this. I went, okay, so we actually technically do have some, but not allocated for, uh, allocatable for, for sale. Him. Yeah, okay. okay. Anyway, yeah, so I rang the customer that had got them allocated to them and said, can I borrow one, please? Of course you can, Dean. Thank you very much. Rang the other customer back and went, right, I've got you one. And yeah. he went, Dean, can't thank you enough. Okay. I missed that. Yeah, okay. I missed it. And that's what I realized I'd done by moving away. And to be frank, you know, after a while, you know, we ended up going our separate ways. So what, what advice would you have given yourself then? Don't make that decision in the first place. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> but surely you, your take would be actually look at the role. But it, it's an interesting concept, isn't it? Because people change roles sometimes and they think it's because we feel that we have... It, uh, a, a wise man learns from a fool's mistake. A fool learns from their own mistakes. Mm. But sometimes a wise man doesn't understand what's good and what's not because yeah. he hasn't actually made any mistakes. So look, I was. So you made well. The word's not mistake here. The word's probably you didn't realize how much you enjoyed something until you stopped doing it. Maybe. Okay. I was honoured to be asked in the first which place. Which is okay. is phenomenal. Uh, it's an uh, achievement yeah. in itself. Uh, um, which is great. Okay. Um, had I spent enough time thinking about what it was that I was leaving behind, I probably would have said no. Okay. And the, and to be fair to the Japanese, as a, um, from a cultural perspective, they, the question was asked before they actually asked because they don't like to ask and get a no. So the, the, first I ask, get it. the first ask was, if we were to ask you, would you say yes? <laughs> All right, so I went away and thought about it, spoke at home, realized that there was going to be um, more travel and mm -hmm. an implication at home. But as a, as a household, we agreed that I'd, I'd say yes. Understood. So then they did ask, and I did say yes. Okay. okay. Had I thought about what I was leaving behind, I would have stayed where I was. So taking out of that for people watching, uh, young or old, sometimes it's a case of really think things through. Don't think that you're not progressing by doing exactly what you're doing and having the change. Because there are a lot of people out there, they don't. they think that sitting still... They lose confidence and they think they're going backwards sitting still. Yeah, well, you're talking to a guy that's been doing heat and ventilating, air conditioning and electrical services for over 40 years. Mm. Okay, yeah? I've never been career orientated in my entire working life. I've just worked hard. Mm -hmm. Okay, People have said to me, you can't just say that, Dean. I went, well, I'm very sorry. You can because yeah. that's what's happened. And what's happened is people have said, we'd like you to look at doing this for us, Okay, yeah. which is great. But in terms of advice... Um, from my own experience, and I can only comment from my own experience, is if you actually really enjoy doing what you're doing, is that a bad place to be? Correct. No, I completely agree with you. And Life that, is very short. We're only on the planet for, for yep. a short amount of time. And I, and the last thing you want to do is lie on your deathbed yeah, I, I, and go, I hated the last 40 years of my life doing what I did. I miss, uh, I miss being, which I, I have sometimes. <laughs> I wake up one morning saying, I want to go back on the tools. 
I love is a, people but don't understand the, the freedom with but interaction. The, but and, the beauty of it is, is you can still do that. If you choose to. Of course, of course. And you know what? I could be on a podcast in 10 years' time. <laughs> and what was Jacob 10 years ago? And you'd say to yourself, it would stop them emails. Them 50 emails a day are killing you, man. Like, get back on the tools. Yeah. Let someone else deal with them. Well, there you go. Right. But yeah, as long as you're enjoying it, is it all that bad? And I really did enjoy being in the air conditioning. So I'd say if I compared it, which I do sometimes, you're soldiers and you're on a battlefield, you actually, it's, you like being caught in a crossfire. Absolutely. You like to be in amongst it rather than sitting in the general's office, moving the, the plastic soldiers along the map. You actually like to be a general or a major on the field, major. knowing ex a major, knowing exactly what's going on. I, I, I wouldn't have a harm in actually being a corporal or a private. It wouldn't bother me. As long as you get, as long as you're doing, as long as you. I reckon at the time, though, you would have, you would have gone. I should have taken that major role, <laughs> which I think we all did. And that's hindsight. That's life, isn't it? With hindsight, I, I do have the benefit of. Uh, I almost got a PhD in hindsight, if I'm honest. Been, <laughs> I've been, I've well, been forty years? Did you say <laughs> forty years? Over that, over that. Right. Okay. So you mentioned a few people um, earlier and at the moment. So, out of all the people you've met on the way, along the way, I know you've mentioned a few people you've worked with, but. You know, I'm 34 today. There's people that I've met along the way. You're being one of them where you look at people and go, damn, they smashed it. Smashed it in a positive way. You know, they've got really high. They've got far. You've stayed at an organization for a long time. I'm sure you've met a few people along the way which you've gone, I need to know them or I look up to them. Mm -hmm. So who are they? Why? And what have you taken out of them? Okay, so... Um, one's my granddad, um, but I won't say to on that too much because that uh, still upsets me. Okay, um, but he was big very part, big part of your life. Very much so, yeah. Um, um, say what you're going to do, do what you say you're going to do. Okay, all right. And was he part of your life when you were younger? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. So part of your get it done attitude, yeah, comes from your granddad a little bit. Yeah. So he big influence in your life. Yeah, and my stepdad. My definitely stepdad's a big guy. Strong life. character, as in people, strong, old fashioned. Principles. Principles. Morals, ethics, so, principles, so, discipline. Yeah, so my dad, um, my stepdad, um, is actually as far as I'm concerned, his dad. Um, he was a landlord, as was his dad. And um he always said to me, Dean, whoever they are, when they walk across the threshold of that, you greet them the same as everybody else and the way in which you would like to be greeted Perfect. yourself. Perfect. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Work to treat. Works really well in sales as well, by the way. 100%. <laughs> there's, a, uh, there's something which I read many years ago in a sales book. They call it the greeting baby. Ben, you're going to love this one. Every person you meet, when you meet a baby, we all go, we all, oh, oh, oh it's so Oh, oh it's so sweet. So, you meet every person like that inside, you think, damn. Like, you subconsciously think, oh, damn, they're not lovely. Yep. Same thing, Very but similar. that's a standard. That but that's a Im embedded in you from a young age. Absolutely, yeah. That's a, yeah. that's something which a lot of people don't have. No, but um, some of us are lucky enough to have been taught it, shown it. it. Hindsight, you're you can say that, and you're aware of it. Whereas some people don't even acknowledge them little <laughs> things sometimes. So your granddad, so the the respect, the down to earthness, meet, treat everyone as you would like to be treated, regardless of who they are comes from that granddad and my stepdad yeah. gotcha yeah. okay so that's more of a principles yeah grounding anyone else yeah so when i joined mitsubishi electric there was a guy that i met um called john formby okay um he was part of my recruitment process and he was a mentor to the direct sales managers okay. and also the sales guys and john was wonderful okay he'd spend an awful lot of time talking to you listening to what was going on uh, and he would never tell you what to do, but what he would do is he would guide you through a conversation so that you'd work out for yourself what it was that you needed to do. Understood. So therefore, it became your idea, and okay. he basically empowered you. He, he was brilliant. What was he like as a person? As in, what if you were to describe him, if he was going to be here this afternoon, for mm. example, what would, what would he be like? Super friendly, or would he be very, very sharp with an agenda? You know, is he one of these people that you'd look at and be like, he's he knows exactly what he's doing. So John had always planned everything before he came into the room. Smart. However, 
he would never impose his will upon a room by being sharp and being Damn. front and center. Okay. He was very quiet, very engaging, fantastic listener. Mm -hmm. But then he would ask you open questions and he would draw from you a solution. Okay. And um, his nickname was Shovel Hands. He had massive hands. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And when he shook your hand, by, by you God, you knew it. Okay. Uh, okay. okay. Um, an absolute gentleman. Okay. Total integrity. Um, he was brilliant. And we all learned from him of that because, again, similar thing, prince, core principles, base core principles of do the right thing, do it the right way. So was this for sales? For Mitz so this was, so he was more of a mentor. So you would lean on him or would he be your sort of line manager as such? No, or no, he was, a, he, was, he was there for us to use as a coach and a guide. So he would support you? Absolutely, yeah. Gotcha. So when they asked me to take on, so when I left running Manchester, they asked me to look after direct nationally. Okay. Latterly, I looked after the whole of sales. Mm -hmm. and latterly, I looked after the division. I said to John, John, they've asked me to do this. And he went, I know, Dean. I have persuaded them that you are the person that okay. they should have. I went, well, thank you. <laughs> Perhaps you might have mentioned it to me. <laughs> and he went, well, Dean, I didn't think you'd say no. Because okay. I did say no to start with. Okay. I had a, quite a nice little life in Manchester, if I'm honest, frankly. And um, he said, well, look, Dean, it needs to be done. I said, well, I'll tell you what, I agree it needs to be done. Martin's moving on, the sales director. I said, I do agree it needs to be done. I said, I'll do it if you will come with me and you will help me oh, and nice. support me. Okay. And he went, it would be my pleasure, Dean. Oh, amazing. Amazing. Yeah. So he went from mentor to not necessarily being beneath you, but in a position where he was there supporting you in your role he was mentoring the guys the same way as he was before Amazing. and he was mentoring me Amazing. as well was he significantly older than oh yourself? yeah he's a similar age he was then a similar age to what i am now 20 understood. years ago understood it, bless him he passed away a few years um and many many mitsubishi people turned up to his funeral really many so you're mentioning his name now so for leaving a leaving a legacy and making a change in life is phenomenal i, I think that um what Mitsubishi Electric did manage to achieve in air conditioning as a team, yeah, an awful lot of that was actually down to John Formby. Really? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I hope many other people agree with it. I think, and I'm sure they will. I think if you were to speak to folks that were around on the journey yeah. from circa 2000 to 2007, mm -hmm. 10, they would agree. Right, okay. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Okay, cool. Um, I've mentioned earlier that you... You, I don't think you follow the status quo, um, but from talking to you now, I feel like you do because you use it to your advantage. So you've mentioned <laughs> market. So rather than fighting against a process, I think you yield to it and then you actually advance from that. So my example is going to be if you have a product that you're bringing out, which everyone else has on the market, I think instead of saying, no, we're going to do something different with our product because that's what the market wants, I think you're going to wait till the end before you show your cards. Um, I think if you were a poker player, I re do you play poker? Oh, God, yeah. You do? Okay, well, I don't. I should. I um, prefer brag. Okay. So, but I, I would say you would probably show your cards right at the end. Well, right at the end, and you probably have a semi-decent set of hands every time. I think you won't... But you just said bra you do like to blag, do you? Like to no, blag? no, brag. A oh, brag. Okay, is that a, is that a game in poker? Three card brag. Okay, right. Okay, so it's a, it's a more simpler form of bra of poker, basically. Yeah. You, um, I think most of the time you'll only keep good cards, and I think, yeah. Every now and then you've got to keep a bad hand just to keep people interested. Yeah. So you're definitely you're not one to say no. I go by the rule book, and if I haven't got a good set, they're going. I, so, so you will keep a. The the idea is is I've mentioned this in a conversation with you earlier. Product development is driven by the market. If you are ready to go early mm -hmm. and you've got something good to go with early, mm -hmm. go. Mm -hmm. An example of that would be CAHV at Mitsubishi Electric and also E-Series yeah. at Mitsubishi Electric. Meaning it's been out a lot longer than it, the market needed it. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. But we chose to do that. Okay. Um, um, Why? Why? Because we could, and we thought we should try. Okay. My my why behind it so strongly is because others have now followed suit, 
and also, in my opinion, your time to shine on, or Mitzi's time to shine on them products is now. So, in my opinion, we should have been selling more of those products earlier. And because we went early, the market was like, mm, I'm not sure. Okay. So people used to say to us, uh, it's too expensive. And my answer was, compared to what? Because there was nothing else out there so to you're using, it You're to. using hindsight here to say that you could have actually influenced the market that much more if you'd pushed harder back then. Yes. Interesting. Why do you not think... I reckon there was probably a bit of disbelief. Or was it a case of it was such a new product that you didn't actually know where it was going to go? I think there was a bit of disbelief on behalf of the sales team. Money wise, it was or or more. They were trying to push a product that no one could understand. They were pushing a product that the market didn't think it was ready for. But then, very quickly, people go, "Actually, didn't you talk to me about that a couple of years ago?" Yeah, yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah. I think I might need one. Only one. <laughs> yeah. So during um, so lo during lockdown, Mitsubishi Electric could not get enough of those products into the UK to meet the demand that they had created. Right, okay. Yeah, which was a proper sickener. So that leads me on to weaknesses. Mm. So a lot of people, a lot of companies, spend more time on their strengths than they do their weaknesses. Hmm. I like to spend, we I sp actively spend a lot of time on our weaknesses. It's the only way a real business can actually strive and grow. You look at your weaknesses and you improve them and over the long term you get better and better. So that's weak. That was a weakness. So did they learn from that weakness, or did you learn from that weakness? Because I would say, on that instance, from my knowledge, you probably did. Because when I talk about hybrid VRF and R thirty two, you unless this was a money thing and the amount of money you had allocated, you threw the kitchen sink at that. Yes, we did. Is that learning from that, or is that actually a completely separate? Uh... It is learning from it. Okay, absolutely. So you, I, I feel, as, as just as a, as a person, that I've learned more from my mistakes than I have from my successes. It's a general trend that we keep yeah. finding. Um, so they, they, they last with you longer. Mm -hmm. Okay. So even if it was, yes, ultimately it became successful, mm -hmm. what did you learn on the journey? Yeah, so the, there's a wonderful thing. Um, Simon Sinek does it. You begin with why. Mm -hmm. Why yeah. are you doing this? Yeah, for sure. yeah, okay. And then you do the how and the what. Yeah. Okay. Most people focus on what and how. Find your why. Yeah. Find your why. Of course. Okay. I, and I love it to pieces. Okay. And we did throw the kitchen sink at HVRF. And we did it for a very, very good reason. Because one, we were the only people that had it. So it was unique to us. But you had the bit like the E series and the uh, CAH. Yeah, yeah. But then every other people were more than capable of very Understood. easily replicating CAHV and okay. ECS. Okay? okay. HVRF, we had it. It was unique. Okay. And there was a need, and there was going to be an even greater need coming forward relative to refrigerants. Refrigerant reduction. Okay. So we knew we were onto something. By the way, I was in the room when Donald Dorr created HVRF. He said, What I think we need, and he drew it all out on a little chalkboard and he went on a whiteboard and he went, That's what we need. And three years later, the Japanese said, this is what we have managed to do so far. And we went, wow. Really? Yeah, brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. So what was the development? Because HVRF was actually out before you actually threw the kitchen sink at it, which Absolutely. I found out because you had 410A, but it only really started getting traction, in my opinion, when it came out in R32. Uh, that is absolutely correct. But that was, again, one of those things which is um, um, a little bit of disbelief. Okay. Is this needed? Is this needed? Oh my lord! It's now. Do you needed. think that's accountability? Nobody wanted to turn around and say, "I've got this, guys. I'm going to take full responsibility of this product and sell." Or I, I think more of an accum uh, a cumulative effort. I, I think it's slightly different, which is, it ain't broke, don't fix it. No, there is that. <laughs> but they developed it in the first place. No, no, no. That's not. That's not the factory. That's the market. I see. So the UK VRF the market. So you had a product sitting there. You just needed the market to say go. We had a product sat there. We needed the market to embrace it. Okay. Right. Gotcha. And the moment 32 came in, they went, oh, hang on a minute. This is what we need. You might be onto something. Gotcha. Yep. Okay. So touching on manufacturers, um, my 
misconception, which you've pulled me up on already today, <laughs> is why do only the top two or three or four manufacturers have the better products or appear to have the better products? What defines a better product we've gone for another podcast isn't necessarily the quality of the product. Sometimes it's the after service and the warranty um, and who you're dealing with and response times, et cetera, et cetera. But if I was to look at a, a lower branded Chinese product, what do, do, do the top three brands have better market share in buying the plastics, buying the compressors, buying the materials? Or are you going to correct me and say, no, it's all to do with the building standards and what they approve? Because for lots of people out there, including, you know, and even with the engineers, I get feedback from my engineers on they love the Mitzi wall mounts. Thick plastic, back plates are brilliant, the measurements are all fine, easy to put in. Whereas some of the other brands, they go, oh, the back plate's really flimsy. The thing doesn't sit straight, you know, and that's our judgment. Mm -hmm. But that's one way of rating a product. Uh, that's a wall mount, by the way. There's the same with, you know, cassettes, ductors, you well, name it. But well, there are more wall mounts sold in the world than there is any other type of indoor. So, okay. So, uh, we could, so wall so mounts I, are a good valid... So I don't think it's a bad, so, place. So, I don't is, think it's a bad place to evaluate from. So is that, is that looked at as... You know, there's obviously reasons why people develop products the way they do, but do the top manufacturers have the better buying rights on the better products, or is that not the case? Scale always has its benefit when it comes down to procurement. It's always going to be the case. Okay? Um, but what I'd say to you where that's concerned is that, in my opinion, okay, the product gap over the last 25 years in terms of perception of quality yeah. has narrowed and narrowed and narrowed. Yeah. I'd agree. Uh, um, and therefore, by definition, it doesn't matter whether it's Japanese, European... Korean, Chinese, it doesn't matter. The reality of it is there's, there's going to be some benefits within it that you're going to see, that you're going to appreciate, and you'll choose, I appreciate that one because of this, and I appreciate that one because of that. Functions, visuals, ease of installation, availability. Whereas uh, many years ago, they're all pretty much the same. Before we had air purifiers and well, movement and well, wind-free and things well, like that. Well, let's put it this way. Right? Prior, to the prior to the pandemic and the lockdown, if you looked at the UK market on splits, the big two would have had over half the market. Yeah. And on VRF, they'd have had over 75% of the market. Okay. okay. Because during the pandemic, there were supply chain issues. Mm -hmm. All manufacturers suffered from that. doesn't yeah. matter what technology you were working with. Um, what happened was people had to try other products elsewhere. Mm -hmm. okay. um, the question you have to ask ourselves is, have they gone back wholesale to the big two? in our sector and the answer would be by definition no okay so you don't get the growth that um the number three number four and number five have had in the last five years just from more product being sold in the market obviously the market's grown mm, yes but residential by, market's grown uh, too uh, substantially. Yeah, but that's only yeah but that it's a small uh, percentage of yeah, the uh, vrf uh, and like, commercial sales like i said to you earlier on right okay even with the rack market trebling in the last five years, it is less than 10% of yeah, the market okay. for HVAC okay. on direct expansion okay. in the UK. So it seems to me like one and two, whoever is number one and two, we know yep. the two, yeah? Yep. Although they may remain one and two, the others will take more share. They have done. So if we said 40-40 for both of them once upon a time and the others were in that pool of 20... Mm we will say they'll probably 30-30 and the pool is getting bigger for the others. Correct. Understood. And if that's the way it is, well, it'll be the same for some time because of the consultancy world. And what, the, why, why, however... Why do they need to go back? Mm. Why do, They've gone elsewhere yeah. and they've got a decent product. Yeah, they've got decent availability. Yeah, no, Decent course. service. Et cetera, well, even et if the product's not so good, you know, it's we've had it with some manufacturers where the product isn't as good. Like we know it's... We've had, we have breakdowns... Mm on, you know, f more breakdowns than we do on a lot of other products. Mm -hmm. But the after serve, they make up the after service so well that <laughs> we are sending WhatsApp messages and, they're send and it's been dealt with. And Not that, to say that that's the way it's going to go, but no, it is. if you don't have the product, if you increase your customer service, you win. So one of the reasons, in my opinion, why the big two became the big two is because of the amount of investment that they put in supporting the product in the market. Okay. Right? which is significantly greater than most of the others could afford. I see. Okay. Only when people 
had to go elsewhere due to lack of availability, did they try it? Product was okay. Yeah. Service was okay. Mm -hmm. Everything was okay. Well, why do I need to? It's 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 strange, isn't it? But yeah, unfortunately, that is the way that the world works. COVID thing where people were then making inquiry. We did it a few times, mm. and then it's it's not so bad. Mm. And on a sales on a sales when you're looking long term relationship with sales, what's really weird with people at the moment? It's I think it's the same worldwide. People are trying new things. So, well, let's try a Korean product. Let's try a Chinese product. That's not so bad. Whereas for many years, and you know these people because you've dealt with, you know, probably most of the big contractors in the UK, they're either red or blue, and the, you ain't changing them. Whereas now you have got people, there's no allegiances to them, so they're quite happy to try something different unless it's specified. Right, so their allegiance is to the service that they provide to their end customer. That is their allegiance. But also relationship. Yeah. Because, you know, I know, I've known, I've heard stories of other manufacturers litting down some of the big boys and they in the corporate world they they get looked after and it all gets brushed under the carpet as such but it actually becomes more sometimes in the corporate world if you are letting down so let's just say for instance you are a high street brand mm -hmm. and you're dealing with um a manufacturer yeah and that manufacturer in some way shape or form lets you down what they've let down is that high street brand not an individual uh, and they can't afford but, but who makes that but who makes that decision from the high street brand well is um, it an, a, a few people or is it the ceo one day saying this is a joke you've held up free refurbs because of your product there you go and then therein yeah. lies the story okay yeah. so that event, happens it, eventually well. it gets back to the person that is an ultimately answerable and they go so explain to me these three stores are not open because what so you couldn't get the no no well did you try and find another supplier because it's just air conditioning, isn't it? Okay. Well, no, no, because we've got an agreement so with... Dean, we have that now. We have that now. We do work for a government uh, client, mm. and we'd be putting in certain products, and the availability is four to six weeks. We just go next door to Team Baby Blue mm. or Dark Blue. We, they've got stock on the shelf. There you go. But their numbers can be... They're not. Their numbers are getting bigger. The bigger we grow, the bigger their numbers get, and it's the same with other companies. 100%. If you haven't, so that's one of our mantras that we have here. Hence, why we hold our own stock. Mm -hmm. If you ain't got it, you can't put it in. Yeah, if so you can't, if you, it doesn't matter if you've got the sales. If you ain't got the kit, with us, it's time actually. At the if moment. you if you take a look across the whole of, of um, direct expansion air conditioning across Europe, okay, the the Me Too brands, as some people or the, you know mm. would refer them as, are getting stronger and stronger and stronger why for exactly what we've just discussed because of choice availability and service yeah. that's all it is okay products <laughs> products un um, an, an uncompetitive advantage so you have a product i know you said it earlier so the product that has shone you know when you retire in 20 years time and you think back, damn, that product was good. Mm. What is the product that you've had on the marketplace? And also the other part of the question, which I don't, you didn't get, maybe you don't want to admit to it, but there must have been a product you come up against as well, and you were like, gits, man. Like, oh, it's our Achilles here, which we all have, but what's the product that you, I don't see fell in love with, but you had and no one can touch? All right, so for me, um, probably because I'm less of a, splits and vrf vrv guy mm. from my uh, from my upbringing i'm a little bit more commercial a little bit more applied yeah um, it is the cahv and the e-series okay those products um the guy that's um, not with us anymore a guy called steve hayward he passed away last year um who was the after sales guy at mitsubishi electric for yep. as long as i was there mm -hmm. um and to quote him he said dean i've never changed a compressor on one of them right yet Okay. And those some of those products were in for 15 years. Mitsubishi compressor? Absolutely. So that is what you would say is a pure Mitsi product? Oh, it's just, uh, yeah. You could drive a bus at it and the bus would come off worse. It's brilliant. <laughs> Bullet, bulletproof. Is this the same product? as Because we've done some of these. Is it the same product as a water cool VRF? 
<laughs> or not? No. Because a wall no. cool VRF is no. is a plate heat exchanger. Yeah. Uh, and but you so attach it to the ground source. But a CHV is like a water cool VRF, but with an air cooler. It's a similar concept, but it's 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 different again. It's a different product. It was specifically designed as air source okay. and inverter, etc. So a CHV unit obviously is seen as I think it's a forty five kilowatt, isn't it? You only do it they did it as a Mitsi do it as a forty five. I believe so, yeah. Um is it the same product as the E series? Nope. It's a different product still. But the concept from its base design is similar. Okay, so that is what you would call as a true Mitsubishi electric product. Absolutely. It stands for their quality, what they what they stand for as a brand, a product, yeah, so and it was designed so you could drive the bus into it and the bus would bounce off. So the thing about Mitsubishi electric, um, and I will say, happily say this even though I'm not there anymore, uh, is that nobody makes products to the same standards that Mitsubishi Electric and I would do. And I would agree with that. So they have a thing called MEQ. It's called Mitsubishi Electric Quality. Nobody makes... It's on all their boxes. It's all I, on their I boxes. And, and it means... It means it, something. A, a proper. Proper does, yeah. Proper does. I could bore you to tears. Who with, started that? Oh, good Lord above. Um, the fourth president back in 1921. Okay. And was that a tick sheet? Was it an ethos? Ethos. It was an ethos. I'll give you an example. Okay, I tell you, I'll tell you a boring but funny little story. If, if Ben edits it, then he edits it. Okay, so they were doing a joint development in America, and they were working with Honeywell, and in that development, it was for a, uh, to a furnace type system, and using a heat pump rather than actually burning. Yeah. And there was a remote control that was being developed with, with this, and um, Honeywell had, had been the people that were doing this. And one of the guys got the controller and he took the batteries out and he went, I'm very sorry, this does not meet Mitsubishi electric quality. Why? What's wrong with it? It does exactly what it says in the tin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the spring that holds the battery in oh, place. Oh, come on. No, no, I'm, de no, I'm deadly serious. Oh, okay. Wow. It had a plain cut at the end of it. A Mitsubishi electric spring has the end turned Go over. Around. Boom. Did it change? Of course it changed. Wasn't going to have Mitsubishi Electric's name on it without it being to MEQ, was it? That's brilliant. It is, and that is the attention to detail. That is so. Mitsubishi if I quality. pull my Mitsubishi Electric remote controller out of my my house or in the office, and I look at the cool spring, it will be curled around. If it's made to MEQ, yeah, it is MEQ. I, I have a controller here. <laughs> <laughs> Can you silently check to see if it's been I, curled around? It I sounds like it probably has. Well, I can do. <laughs> um. Okay. Fine. Let's look at the future. Sure. Um, on a macroeconomic perspective, mm. my opinion on this is innovation. Unless Elon Musk comes up with something, I know he's got something in the pipeline. My opinion is innovation has almost stopped. And it's almost stopped because it's been replaced with the desire of the market to push low GWP refrigerants. My example is we've quoted recently to replace some chillers. We've gone for E-Series. Mm. However, the original spec was an R1234ZE, mm -hmm. condenserless option, mm -hmm. which is a propane. It needs ventilation, and it also needs a leak detection alarm. The cost is high, almost double the price. I think three times the price of the E-Series. The efficiencies aren't as good. What's going on? Yeah, okay. So there are two things I would drive, I would say that are driving that. This is just my view from a helicopter from afar. Yeah. Okay. Um, I could be wrong. Um, I don't think I am. I think I'm close. So the um, whole situation to do with innovation is a huge amount of R&D time is being spent to meet the market forces, which is GWP reduction. Okay. And I don't think we should underestimate how much time and effort it actually takes to basically move a product, let's say, from 410A to 32, and then latterly maybe to 454C. Someone like me, without the the knowledge, would say, oh, it's only changing a few, the gas and a few sensors. I'm afraid it's significantly more than that. Okay. okay? Um, and that therefore, I think we underestimate how much resource, money, is required to invest to ensure that the GWP trajectory can be achieved. There is also another thing which I mentioned to you in a previous conversation, which is product development is like an arms race. Okay, And depending on how important a particular product is within your portfolio, yeah. you will spend more time focused on that 
because you can either go earlier or it's re or it's more revenue generating for you as an existing as okay. a, a business. So for instance, in for instance, Mitsubishi Electric, okay, um, three pipe oblique heat recovery, simultaneous heating and cooling mm -hmm. is dominant in the UK and Ireland. Okay? Yeah. Whereas it's heat pump. So where do they focus their time? Mm -hmm. There's more heat pump market than there is heat recovery. Yeah, of course. By definition, because yeah, yeah, Europe's bigger than the UK. Yeah. Where do you spend your time? Okay. Um, it's a little bit like um, splits. Uh, rack room air conditioners in southern Europe are everywhere, okay? Whereas VRF is not. Mm. It's actually still on the rise. Where do you spend your money? Mm -hmm. Okay. And the second thing is how much quota do I have? Mm -hmm. Because quota is a tradable commodity. F-gas quota is a tradable no. commodity. It is, okay? And some people... So you could sell me your quota? Uh, you, you can sell your quota, absolutely, yeah. It's perfectly permitted. Wow. You have to, you have to, it all has to be uh, tracked and traced and all the rest of it because there's only so much quota to go around. Okay. Something. Sounds like a form of uh, cryptocurrency. Then. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. They yeah. can't, you can, you, you know, does, does the, do the quota numbers increase a every ton, year? A ton of quota has a value. Blimey. Damn. I know what I'm going to invest in when I get today. <laughs> <laughs> Look up quota for <laughs> F gas refrigerants. Is it in Europe or worldwide? Uh, globally. Who sets the quota? Um, that's actually to do with the trajectory of the downturn of how much how, how much is available. Really? Yeah, globally. Damn. That's bananas. And that is where the innovation has come. But is in how can you keep selling as much product at as much value as you budget to do mm -hmm. whilst meeting the trajectory of the turn down in global warming potential? So this is all to do with this uh, low, lowering your global footprint. Absolutely, and, carbon, carbon reduction. Um, obviously, we've all got a view on it. You know, for me, I'm still in love with R22. So am I. Still in love with it. Um, bring back safe. Well, I you probably say shouldn't have cleaned, You probably shouldn't have cleaned the coils down with it. <laughs> it's probably that was before my day. No, of course it I, was. We were we were reclaiming. We were we were scared. <laughs> we were always worried about not having paperwork filled out in your vans and getting fined mm. and things like that. You'd hear someone was fined at Wolseley and things like that, but. I feel like there's too much focus on it. I feel like it's something that my dad said to me the other day. He was like, Jacob, I was at university. My dad's in, like, he's a like a verifier for EdXL mm -hmm. and he's worked with universities all his life. And he's like, Jacob, the incompetency these days in this country, you couldn't you couldn't write. And I was like, what do you mean? He was like, I met a professor which was approving work, which was substandard, but he was the only professor that they could employ with the professor credentials. And I'm just sort of thinking... I have that in. I see that with us. It's like we're focusing. It's like the 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 market is saying lower GWP, and people are pushing it. But where is that next product to say? Actually, I'm going to park your GWP. Check this unit out. It uses the older gas, half the gas. It's more efficient. We don't need to. Or are you going to say to me, "Well, Jacob, I'm afraid that gas might be obsolete in a few years." I am. So. To my mind, there are two things here, okay? Um, GWP, whatever the conversation is, whatever the industry you're in, we're all being driven by the same thing, and we're being driven by carbon reduction, mm -hmm. okay? So the electrification of society is inevitable. That's a good thing for HVAC because we use electricity. Electrification so. of society fueled by coal and nuclear power stations. But not for long, Okay. So in, you know, there are certain days in this country that we are not burning anything to feed the demands Where's of the grid. Where's it coming from, Dean? It's coming from wind turbines and stuff like that. Do you know about wind turbines and the dangerous materials used? It, I, 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 look, okay. You wouldn't want the truth to get in the way of a good story now, would you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So what you've got to do is you've got, you've got this to... This is, Ben, this is where Dean is bang on the status quo <laughs> because he needs to be... Not for what he does now, but just because that's where it's going. Look, it's dead simple. I've got five kids, okay? My youngest is 10 in a couple of weeks, a couple of months' time, okay? One and a half degrees is going to happen, okay? What the implications of one and a half degrees are is not nice. The okay? only thing is, though, which is another conversation, that one and a half degrees is still open to discussion. Is it? 
I think it is. Because I, I think the world was a hotter place once upon a time. I haven't got the stats, uh, but... Yeah, and it, all, and it all turned to rat shit, is all I'll say to you. Uh, okay. You're probably going uh, about the Mayans. The, the, the rumour is Mayans disappeared not because of some special god. It was because of heat yep. and drought. So, <laughs> so what I'm going to say to you is, is that climate change, regardless of what anyone says, okay, is an incontrovertible truth. Right, okay. No one can deny that climate change is happening. Okay? How we cope with that is a different thing. Mm. Do we go about trying to do something to make a difference such that we slow down the rate of that so that we can have longer to adapt and yeah. cope? Well, that seems a sensible thing to well, do my, to me. My fear with it, and others you know, where we sit slightly to the right will <laughs> say, uh, that's the side of the fence I'm on, is we're consuming more energy and burning more fuel to get to that number. That's so because, it's that's because we need to invest more in how we generate the energy that we consume. The challenge uh, which I completely so you, agree, however, so you, so you, however so hang on, so you make the products more efficient. How do you make them more efficient? You make them more efficient by one making them more efficient, mm. okay? And if the innovation means that you use a particular type of substance because it could be different technologies, yeah. okay? And that actually means that you um, emit less energy in generating that substance mm -hmm. and you emit less energy by making that product. And when you use the product in its life, you use less energy. Mm -hmm. That's got to be a good thing. That, that's the only thing I would say. Uh, in a macroeconomic sense? Absolutely. Fantastic. Yeah. In a meeting somebody that lives in a three bedroom house that has bought an air source heat pump, which is 10 years old and it's failed and they need 15,000 pounds to replace... The answer is no. They're better off replacing it. Why does it cost 15 grand to replace it? Because us, you, well, <laughs> manufacturers are very clever. We've done the video, Ben, haven't we? <laughs> and the answer is this, and it's just life. New condenser, new controls, sometimes a new cylinder. But the outdoor unit is three grand, tops. New cylinder? Uh, two grand. So it's now five grand. With markup, it's six grand, seven grand. Why is it 15 grand? The, I don't know about you, Dean. Well... With some people that they buy a house for £400,000, £7,000 is a lot of money. Absolutely. It's a holiday. And it's a bloody good holiday. And that's the challenge that we have with that yep. side of things. But I completely get with the question where that's why GWB is being targeted so much. My only thing with it, the stupidity thing, which go back to the R32E series, which I think R2, now R32 is here, which I feel like isn't going to be here for much longer. That E series chiller had 18 kilos per, per system. Mm-hmm. The R one two three four Z E system, nearly 80, 90 kilos. Yeah, it's a good way to go, isn't it? But you've got ninety kilos of something which just got a GWP of I think one hundred and fifty or two hundred. One four eight, I think. Is it one four eight? Versus six seven five with a with a quarter of the charge. And I'm looking at it thinking, I'd rather the R thirty two in my building. It's cheaper to re re repair and replace, and there's a lot less gas. But in five years' time, that'll be an R two ninety with a GWP of. 10. Yeah. So that's where we're going. Yes. So if the efficiency doesn't meet it, it's irrelevant because we need to get to that lower figure. Have to do both. Both. Okay. So Cons in a mu consume in a less, emit less. In a in a world where at the moment we've got so many products coming to market, you think it will settle down as low GWP and then once a low GWP has been nailed that's when the efficiencies will change significantly. Yeah. Because I feel at the moment, I'm sure everyone is doing this. It is just lower the G. It's like an arms race for a lower GWP. Got the first air source heat pump on R290. Let's come after me. And then everyone else does it. And that's exactly what it is. Because that's what's required to be done in the market. Yes. What are the, um, for anyone that wants to step ahead of the game, how can we start getting feelers for what the market wants? Because. Mike Tyson said something on a podcast recently, which I think is amazing, by the way. He's quite a clever guy, even though he's, you know, he's known for punching people in the face. If you want to see the future of your country, look what's on the news. <laughs> okay. And when you look at it that way, it don't look great for us, but the news isn't giving us any telltale sign of where the market's going. All right, so look. Where is the market? Where are the, what are the indicators? Um, the answer to that is, if I knew that, I wouldn't be sat here and I wouldn't be working. <laughs> Would <Right>? you be? <laughs> okay. okay right. Right. So the answer is I don't know. Okay. But what I what I can say to you is it is um it goes in cycles, right? So what I'm I'm lucky enough to have been around for over 40 years in HVAC. When I first started, okay, it was all chiller, 
four pipe VAV induction terminal fan coils etc. When mm -hmm. I first started, okay, and then latterly along came this thing called VRV, mm -hmm. okay, which latterly became VRF, mm -hmm. which is other people's brand uh, name for it, um, etc. etc. And when we first started, you would do a job with maybe two hundred and fifty kilowatts maximum on. Yeah. You know, we now do two point five megawatt mm -hmm. without any. Okay? Well, we won't be able to do two point five megawatt using traditional VRF because of the gas. Because of, of the amount of refrigerant. Okay. okay? Um, so we're going to end up going back to systems that are maybe a maximum of 50 kilowatt in outdoor unit capacity. Okay. So we'll go back to doing maybe 500 kilowatts using VRF, VRV. Okay. So what are we going to do with the 2.5 meg? Well, we're going to go back to doing hydronic. I and, see. Okay. So we go inside. But how do you do that consuming less energy with less global warming potential? Dead simple. Low GWP refrigerant in the mm. outdoor units, be it doing the heating and doing the cooling. Mm -hmm. Okay which is reverse cycle heat pumps, electric, not burning anything, don't, no gas point. So we've evolved it mm -hmm. over a 40-year cycle, mm -hmm. okay? We've gone all the way through. We've gone all the way back. And now we've gone back, although we're doing it better than we did 40 years ago. Yeah, of course. And that's, that's what I think it looks like. Okay. That where you think it looks like with GWP, where does AI come into the mix? Because AI is noise. It's everywhere at the moment. But... I feel it's going to come into our industry pretty quickly. It's already, it's already here. It's already here. So, the does it? Does it? I I made a comment on a video we did in AI where I made made a comment and said, you know, it was like the Eastern Europeans coming to the UK taking our jobs. That was the thing, wasn't it? You know that mantra like they're taking our jobs. Yeah. Are yeah. we going to have that with? I can't personally see it. I can see it can only enhance the control. But what I can see AI doing is fixing systems making them to run more efficiently to the way products are used. But also if there are small fixes, for example, being able to adjust the mister values because it notices a difference in an ambient versus reality, that could potentially put engineers at the job replacing parts. All right, you so know. how many... All right, look. Yes, that is where it's going to go. All right, okay. So the ability for the data to be um, retained... Mm -hmm and um, you learn the history of a, of a performance of a piece of kit. Okay. You can therefore do preventative intervention. So you can see that an LEV is actually um, coming towards the end of its shelf life because it's not controlling, it's not shutting down properly. And it would it's, see that rather than it completely fails yeah, or exactly. it's slowly failing. Yeah. So you've already got your planned maintenance taking place, but you know that as part of that, you say to your customer, we can see from the data that we need to change this valve. So when we do our planned maintenance, we'll come and do that at the same time. So we're not having to take that mm -hmm. unit out yeah. of service twice. Okay. That, to me, is a positive to the customer experience, the customer journey. That's a positive. It's a positive that the industry can offer. Okay. Isn't the AI, though, going to fix it before? Because if it, it's it, going to fail, it's going to fail because it's a mechanical component. Yes, but the AI has already said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. We've got a failing component here. Yeah, You're but... But that doesn't mean that you're – what it means is that you, the people that are doing the service and maintenance, know it's happening. Before it happens. Before it happens. Okay, positive. That's positive. From a negative, adjusting values, um, do you like your people going around doing optimization, mm. or would you rather actually carrying out physical repairs mm. on a mechanical failure? Mm. Okay, Where is the actual real value to yeah, your business or to the industry's business? So sometimes you get called out, and it's well, it's literally sticky finger syndrome. People have been playing with the remote oh, course, controller. Okay, AI would go. Oh, I'm going to reset back to the last time I defaulted. Okay, that's a positive because you're not running around for false so, alarms. So the AI, which we don't know which what what type or what it's going to be, we will need to know what input is being put into that. Yeah. So where that's is the, it coming from? So, so so that's the data. Okay. So who owns the data is more of the question relative to this than it is anything. So if um, I think that people um, like yourselves, okay, will work with manufacturers with a view to having access to the data for the products that you've installed for which, your customers. Which, for example, is already out there in America. Absolutely. So Mitsubishi Electric and Daikin in America, they have a system where you can control all your clients' units from an app. Yeah. Uh, on their computer. They've right. done it for the dongles and it's like a con central control system and it's a product that you sell to the client. Absolutely. 
AI would remove that person. Would it? Only to a certain point. So it'd be integrated. It would be integrated to actually assist. Only to a certain point. Okay, yeah. so that's a positive. That's in, in a in a, yeah. in a but big brother in a big brother sense. Yeah. Ultimately, some of the work that we do today, we will not be doing moving forward mm. because it can be done preventatively via intelligence. Yeah. However, you're not going to get artificial intelligence to change a compressor. Of course you're are not. You? Of course you're not. Okay. Unless the compressor completely changes with some kind of thermal fusion or something. I, or, do you know what? Okay. Or I'll, heat. Be, I'll be dead by then. So I, <laughs> I, I think I might be as well. Well, well I don't know. Actually, you don't know, do you? But talking of that, um, a few manufacturers have played around with different products, haven't they? Um, I know uh, Team Blue have got a, a material that goes around a compressor. And a, uh, was it called a, a phase changing material? Yep. Have you played around with any of that stuff? We all did in the seventies. See the joys of being a really old so and so. So what, okay. what have you? Uh, have, have, have anything was, recent? Was, anything that's, recent or not? No, that was no, not recently. No, because I know yeah. some manufacturers they use them. I think they change the. They use them as crankcase heaters. I think they can change the, and it's a it's a slow. It's a way to reduce the amount of energy consumed from direct electric consumption. You can store thermal energy. Uh, Sanamp do a thermal heat battery, which you use the same sort of product. It's basically a phase change material. So back in the late seventies, early eighties, we had ice storage systems yeah. where you'd run your chiller at night when you didn't need it. Do you have a funky block or something that you exactly, yeah, and you're a massive cylinder. How did they find? How did they long term? It didn't efficient. work very well because they Long were all term. because they're all, they're all the compressors were direct online and didn't like going oh. stop start forward backwards. Okay, but now we have inverter. We can, you know, we we can actually adapt. Do, dare them. I say? Do I feel like some of the heat recovery chillers have got phase change material in them? I, I wouldn't be surprised. Okay, just to assist in slow release, yeah, creating some form of thermal inertia. Maths, uh, you know, to to change to store, you need mass. Right. Okay. Mm. Right. So your refrigerant of the future. Let's just nail that quickly. What is the refrigerant of the future? In what? your opinion. <laughs> For what? For, for VRF and for residential? Okay, Cause... so for resi, okay, I think that we will be able to use R290. And I think that will have a shelf life of beyond 30, 2035. Um, because I think the amount of refrigerant in a back to back um, air to air split yeah. will be low enough to be permissible okay. in a air to water mm -hmm. um, um, monoblock type um, heat pump. Um, Again, it's all contained in the outdoor. Yeah, of course, yeah. Um, so I'm I'm totally relaxed with that. Um, VRF, um, I think it's going to go four five four C. Okay. Um, uh, uh, by the way, that doesn't that doesn't make me very insightful. That just makes me I've read what Dakin are going to do. <laughs> okay, and they've already but, announced that they're going to do it. But the C, Dakin... the C gives me horror stories of R four O seven C. There's no the... no. Is it a blend? Three stage blend or? It's a two stage blend. It's okay. a two stage blend. Okay. But, but um. The point of it is, is, is that that's, that's only got a shelf life because it's. I think that's about one fifty. That's only going to last until a certain time. Frame. So, is the plan to get to zero? Well, it's got to be or below one. ten. Below ten. Below ten. Yeah. What, do you know what's below ten at the moment? Or uh, no. Two ninety. R two ninety is below ten. Yeah. So you but think VRV is too much because it's a propane yeah, and it's but, explosive. So, but if you think about HVRF, okay, which obviously my old employer has, it, it could be an R two ninety, and it, you've got water in between the fangles. The boom. Maybe it is still ahead of its time. It was, and it is. It's still ahead of its time. It was brilliant. He was a very, very clever guy. I'd love to know the differences in costs. A consultant could probably answer it, or maybe you could. Four port, four pipe chiller installation with fan core units versus HVRF installation. Well, I'll tell you now, HVRF will smash it out of the park all day every in day. In installation. And pound per kilowatt. Damn. Pound, pound per kilowatt. That's Damn. What, it's, that's what you're all about, pound per kilowatt. That's nuts, isn't it? Mm -hmm. we've not put in a four pipe chiller but we've been sort of semi involved with a client that was looking at them heat recovery chillers yep and they were ve it was very expensive product and by the time we looked at the cost of doing it versus the energy saving it wasn't that significant coming off boilers which were perfectly working fine mm -hmm. but if you're saying that the hvrf solution obviously it's not doing the hot water but then saying that can and you put you put a separate i, I don't know okay but, but um I, I would have put the a cost i would have put a separate co2 system in for the hot water. Interesting. So maybe that is a product that we need to watch out for. Not 
that we need to actively watch out for it, but it's something that's Brilliant. going to be around for a long time. I, I don't think I'm actually saying anything out of turn, but I reckon if you were to speak to one of the lads at Mitsubishi Electric as to how long it would be before they have a 290 HVRF. It's probably not a million miles I away. wouldn't be surprised at it. And, I, and I, the answer is I don't know. I do not know. It's like, this is like Spider-Man and the Kryptonite. Like, this is it, like, this is, the, this is the superpower. You, like, with Top Trumps, it's the... No one can well, touch that, when, really, when, product-wise. When Donald drew it out on the on the whiteboard, and he said, and the beauty of it is, is we can manage how much refrigerant there is between the outdoor and the in, and the and the BC controller, yeah, and we can contain it. So when the when we change the refrigerant type, mm -hmm. the only bit that we're looking at is that amount of refrigerant, rather than hundreds and system. thousands. Yeah, yeah, of the, course. Yeah. It was a moment of genius. Wow. It's a clever lad. When was that? Oh jeez! Are we? Um, are, was that a long time ago? Two thousand and eight. I know. Clever lad. He had no idea, and you no, had no idea of what refrigerants were going to do by then. We all we knew then that there was going to be a downturn. You did. Yeah. So that was a way of reducing the refrigerant volume. Okay. So it wasn't just we've come up with this ingenious product which actually uses water between the fan core it, to the BC. It, 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 it was we can reduce the refrigerant volume. Yep. But you also kind of knew that you might have to reduce GWP in the future. We did. Gotcha. Okay. Right. Closing up. <laughs> um, thank you very much for answering all the questions. You're welcome. Um, As remember, it's only what I think. It's been brilliant to have you here. <laughs> no, what you think is important because you've you've been in the industry for a long time and we haven't. And a lot of the people that like to talk and have opinions – I've only been in the industry for 10 minutes. So you've probably been there and done that a lot of times and seen a lot of T-shirts. That's your way of saying you're very old, Dink. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. You said that. <laughs> um, closing up. So engineer, we have engineers that watch the show, our engineers, other company engineers, and hopefully future engineers. We have people working in offices in our industry, sales, marketing, you name it. Out of the sales... A lot of salespeople watch this and they're going to be interested to hear what you want to say and got to say. Advice for them because out of the people you've mentioned, your granddad being one of them, your stepdad and the gentleman, was his name John? John Formby. John Formby. They, they were, there were traits that they had. Out of the people that are watching that I've mentioned that are quite good at what they do and they're looking around people in the room thinking, well, they're doing a bit better than me, but... I'm not too sure what I need to do to get to that next step. So for me, I'd say five steps ahead. Where do we need to get? If we want to get there, how do we get there? What would your advice be? Personality, personality, technically, you know, getting on with everyone? Or is it a case of actually, no, do your own thing? What's, what's worked for you? Cool. Um, well, I haven't managed to get on with everyone, I can assure you, um, okay. over the 40-odd years. There have been you know, some people that we've agreed to disagree, shall okay. we say. Um, and is that people you've worked with? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and customers. And correct customers. me if I'm wrong. Were you respected for that? Uh, well, I think we equally were respected because you know, um, I, I think what people would say about me is that I am straight. Mm -hmm. um, I can be a little bit blunt, yeah. um, but I'm trying to come at it from the right place. Understood. Um, whether we've agreed to disagree mm -hmm. and we've gone our separate ways. Well, that's a matter of choices, isn't it? You know, either either the customer or the colleague that's said, I don't want to work with this business anymore, um, or me going, I don't want to work with that pe those those, those okay. people anymore. Okay. So you're not you you, so you you wouldn't ever advise. Well, some people you, you're not a people pleaser, but <laughs> to a to to a certain degree. But being direct and being focused on what you do is what you would suggest. Just be straight, okay. Sometimes it will cost you, but be straight. Okay. And that's, again, going back to my granddad, my stepdad, and yeah. uh, John and Formby. That's, and that's worked for you and John Formby. Absolutely. And working along people alongside, you know, people that you've worked alongside through the years, have you noticed that some haven't been straight and they've not ended up potentially where they wanted to be? I don't know is the answer to that. Because um, one thing that I'm, 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 I've been st struck, but in a positive way, that you've actually openly said that, if you had spoken to Dean when he took the president's role, you probably would have said, don't take it because you've missed that. Yeah. Um, so hindsight for you has been, is invaluable for some of the people watching because a lot of engineers sit there thinking, oh, I want to be better than an engineer. 
Whereas some people are so good at engineering, they don't even understand. They, they don't realize how good they are All right. because they feel like they need to be doing the next thing. But so sometimes the next thing is actually just being better at what you do. So the best analogy I can give you for that, okay? Um, I, I said what I said earlier on. If you actually enjoy doing what you're doing, is the grass actually greener on the other side of the fence? Okay, if you actually enjoy it. Okay. However, the question I guess individuals can ask themselves is, do I feel valued doing what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. My best example of that is a guy who was promoted inside of Mitsubishi Electric to be a sales manager. Yeah, came to me a few years later and said, Dean, I don't enjoy this. Doing the people stuff, I don't enjoy it. I love doing the customers. I love doing the internal reaction with, amongst the, the whole of the, 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 the organization. But actually managing people is not for me. Okay. And I went, okay, no problem. Um, well, in which case, if you want to go back to doing what you were doing, you can do. And he went, yeah, but I don't want to lose the money. I went, well, who said you're going to? It's about valuing you for what you're good at. Okay. Uh, and we did do. He did go back to being a sales guy. Okay. Um, and he is now back being a manager again. Okay. Uh, okay. But that was 10 years on. Understood. Okay. So it wasn't right for him at the time. Um, but we said, okay, well, you know, we'll value you for what you're good at. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that we can all learn, be it as ourselves. Am I valued? Yeah. Okay. Everyone wants more money. Everyone. Even, you know, I want more money. Okay. But am I being valued appropriately for what it is that I'm actually contributing? To make sure you feel yeah. valued. Yeah, and exactly. And secondly, you know, we as employers need to value people accordingly for what it is that they actually do. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Interesting. Okay, thank you very much. So closing up, Dean. Hey, hiya. Yep. So when I saw you were there, I don't know the brand, by the way, but it's That's a okay. Chinese product. So yep. 90% of air conditioning engineers out there will probably say Chinese product. What's new there? What's happening? Your role. What can we expect? Okay. So look, my role um, is about uh, continuing the development of European expansion. Um, we have operating trading companies in Spain and Italy. Mm -hmm. where we will be setting them up in the UK, which basically means stock in the market for the UK. We'll be setting one up in Germany, one in France, probably mm -hmm. also one in Hungary for Eastern Europe as well. So what it means is, is that hey, are recently on a, from a HVAC perspective, are yep. going to basically set them themselves up properly to serve the markets that it is. So in. does that mean direct channel or does that mean only wholesale through okay. distributors? Distribution and wholesale. Where is technical coming from? Um, in the country. So, so will you, will, you will open a technical arm? Absolutely, yeah. Rather than doing what some of the big boys are now doing, which we detest, they're offshoring their technical. Uh, well, and they go in on a like a importance level, and then yes, yeah, so if you did when you get there, Dean, my advice to you is this: <laughs> go on, I'm all ears. If we're one of your top sellers and we've got the badge, you know, DQP, BSP, you know, uh, D1 Plus, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, mm -hmm. don't send us offshore because we know what we're talking about. Whereas, unfortunately, the offshore model it doesn't value that, and whoever you put your code in and you still end off offshore asking if there is power to the unit and you're right. waiting up to four hours for technical and when we talk earlier about dipping into the smaller the smaller market share dipping into the bigger that's cheesing people off okay so i cannot believe that the major brands in our industry have done that that's my answer arrogance no i think it's cost management cost They've thought of trying to save a thousand, how can, how can a thousand I, calls a minute. Let's offshore five hundred of them, and I, I can only assume it's cost, that, that behind that will be we'll be able to provide a better customer service, mm. and they'll analyze it statistically. I'm sure. I, I'm absolutely certain of it. Okay, um, but the reality of it is, is it's actually about the customer experience. Hundred um, percent. So I can assure you that as higher, okay, we are. Going, we go to market through distributors and wholesalers. That's okay. what we do. Be it wholesalers predominantly for um, heating and air conditioning distributors. Okay, and we will work with our partners, which mm -hmm. is what we call them all, um, to um, for them to support their customers, and we will support our partners. Understood. So and we'll do you'll, it our, using our own employees. So you'll have technical. So will the technical be done for the distributors, or would you? Or you're not sure yet. Both. 
you'd have a bit of technical distributors training and then you'd have technical yep. completely separate which engineers could phone correct so you're doing another startup in the <laughs> uk because the <laughs> uk hire is a very small some people won't even know who the, what the brand is that's okay but it tastes you know one of the things that's interesting about here okay is if you take a look at the other part of the Haya business, which is an appliances business. Oh, so yes. It is the largest appliances business in Europe, mm. bar none. Okay. So by Haya, defin- Hisense, you got a you got a Curry's, you're seeing them. Yeah, and what you're actually seeing is very high end, high quality products. Okay. Are you positioning yourself there? Are you positioning yourself low cost? So if I was to buy a higher product, are you going to say? Your one of your USPs is we're a lot cheaper than the major brands. Um, we will be at a lower price per kilowatt than the 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 the, the big two, shall we say? And are you um, going to say to me that your premium product it might not look as nice, but you're getting almost the same value, the same efficiencies? Um, I think looks is subjective, okay. Um, but our premium product is as good as anyone else's premium product. Are they different colours? Or not yet? Yeah, white and black. Oh, you have got white and black. Okay, and and that, like most things, when certain products sell out, you then bring out different colors and things. And if you were going to go down that route. Uh, so one of the things that is, look, at the moment it's white or black. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. Um, that's more to do with breadth of coverage mm-hmm. as to what you offer. I get it. Right? Okay. I get it. If you lose a certain amount of work, because uh, a certain amount of customers, because people want silver units, a silver unit might be 0. 0.000 of market share. Correct. That's no different to um, Daikin have a, a piece of kit, which was, I think they called it Beautiful Cassette, which is the four-way blow under ceiling. Yeah. Sorry about that. And the only country in the world in which they sell it is under the ceiling, U- four-way blow. It's a Gree product. But that's just maybe. It may be now. It is a Gree product. No, it's been it, a Gree product for a long time. Yeah, but it wasn't when they first made it. And, and it was made for the UK market. The UK said, this is what we need, what is what we need. Mm. They made it. And when they offered it to the rest of Europe, the rest of Europe went, no, thank you. Oh, okay. Which right. is why it's now a Gree product. I see. Because Understood. they're not making enough money out of it. Understood. If you just think it's Similar through, kind of thing. I don't know that factually, but if you just think that through. Yeah, yeah, for uh, sure. Yeah, okay. so, so we need to change the misconception that Chinese products are inferior. Well, remember what I said to you earlier on, okay? When the pandemic hit and China shut down, every manufacturer had to evaluate how much percentage of China inside doesn't matter what product it was you were making mm-hmm. how much china mm-hmm. s- sourcing was in there okay and for many many companies yep it was a rather disconcerting number so what you're saying is jacob a japanese product basically was unavailable during the pandemic pandemic due to china being closed one of the reasons so there's a lot of chinese components in these products of course so you need to look at our product and say there's not a huge difference in the products anymore. They've, Whereas I, I said that earlier on. If I spoke to Dean Flint 10 years ago, your attitude would, of course, be completely different. But is that because the Chinese products have come a hell of a long way? Absolutely. Interesting. Yeah, it's more to do with... So we need to be more open, Dean, with looking at your products. Well, because, you have, you, you, because one, don't, don't judge a book by its cover. Correct. And two, if you're being supported and the product isn't too bad, and it is slightly lesser costing... You'd be a fool for not using it. Well, absolutely. But let's look at what we said earlier on in the conversation. During the pandemic, when supply chain was contracted, Mm -hmm. the industry had to look elsewhere. Mm -hmm. It actually had a good experience by looking elsewhere. That's not a bad thing, is it? Of course not. Okay. Chinese products, Korean products, Japanese products, European products, it doesn't matter, okay? As long as you get a decent product at a decent price with a decent service with a good and good support yeah. and it meets the spec, why would you not consider it? Yeah, for sure. Now, you're right. Ten years ago... I Reliability have... is obviously a big thing. Well, it's the same thing, though. It amounts to the same thing. Okay, So even if the product has a failure, because all products fail at some point in time, okay, it's how it's responded to yeah, when it fails. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. So, so your approach will be copying, looking at the competition's weaknesses... No. Or so, actually just supporting them. So our thing about, for instance, about the UK, that will be about acquiring new partners with a view to providing national coverage yeah. for the outlet of our products. Okay. Right? 
And some of them will be better at VRF than they are at splits and vice versa. Do they have a good VRV? The yeah. VRF? Oh, yeah. they do? Yeah. Okay. Rather handy, actually. Well, compressor. Where's the compressor? Is it a Chinese compressor? <laughs> it's, I think it's a Mitsubishi electric compressor. Oh, is it really? <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Okay. <laughs> is that is that a think or possibly might be true? It's a think. Okay. Fine. Mm. Interesting. But so, okay. the, the, so the reality of life is, is that Mitsubishi electric probably sell more compressors on an OEM basis than they do actually in their own product. Because they're Mitsub one of the largest manufacturers of compressors in the world. And their compressors are very good, but it's a different part of the business. Is that right? It, it's one, it, all, it all comes back to the same thing eventually. Yeah, I okay. see. Yeah. Interesting. But the Siam compressor is a piece of beauty. Which is a Mitsubishi electric compressor. Absolutely. This is no different to the Aston Martin Vantage, which is a Mercedes V8. It's a Mercedes platform. And all the purists go, no way. How can you put a Merc in a British car? Well, actually, the platform is very good. The engine is very good. We're just going to tweak it to the way we want to control it and the way it yeah. works. Which do you like the look of best? Which one do you get the best experience in? Which one do you get the best That's customer exactly support? It. And you can't have that sometimes by having a complete fresh product. So using interchangeable parts from other brands is inevitable. Global manufacturing by scale. Yeah. So a little bit like, you know, with the old um, the turbo diesel engine, mm. you can get a 1.9 or a 2 litre TDI, something mm. of that nature, okay? But you can get five different power outputs from it can't yeah, you yeah of course yeah boom yeah of course. same thing yeah same thing wonderful thank you very much dean pleasure thanks for having me been amazing you being here like and subscribe any questions please do get in touch thank you very much